bless you all. Amen. John, would you come up here? Did, did John come tonight? <laughs> you listen to what I'm talking about. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Give up for Bill here, man. You <laughs> yeah, power plants of energy here. Yeah. It's all, all those energy just plug right in the building. So thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, good to be here. Thank you. After being in D.C. for the past four years in the Trump administration, being in the swamp, Surrounded by these swamp creatures, they just recharged me to be around regular Americans and patriots. Amen. So I feel like you're just giving me energy being here. I still haven't recovered. I've been back from DC for what a year, so I'm still recovering from the swamp. But I'm also ready to keep fighting the swamp. I kind of missed the fight, so that's why we're jumping in here to get back in this. As I said, I was in the Trump administration for pretty much the entire four years. I worked at HUD under Dr. Ben Carson, and we had all the fights we could imagine. Before I entered the government. Never at my work, at my place of employment, have I raised my voice, swore, and told someone off. But I did against these rhinos in D.C. on two different occasions. They will trigger you. They will bring out dark things inside of you you never thought were there. When you see these people that are supposed to be on our side, just turning around and backstabbing the American people time after time after time. If you are a Christian, a person of faith, it will put you to the test to continue to be gracious when dealing with such people. This is why when CNN first attacked me back in 2018, at first I was a bit upset, but then I said, you know what I should do? I need to open up the word. You're here, amen. But I did not open up to the place that most people open up to. I started with Psalm 3, which, in which the Lord says, uh, which David says, God smash the teeth of the wicked. <laughs> That's right. That's where I was at. So I am reading that over and over again just to kind of be in God's presence and help to calm me down a bit. Then I went to Psalm 69. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee from before his face. May they vanish like smoke vanishes before the fire. That's where we got to be at today, where this country is at right now, or else we're going to be done. we got to be right there. So I encourage you when you do your Bible reading, keep doing what you're doing, but add that onto it also. Go into your songs and read some of these verses, which have a fighting spirit to them. Now, is that being literal that you're going to go and smash one's teeth? As much as we may have felt like that before and sometimes do feel like it, no, we're just talking about the fight we have to have in us, the fighting spirit. Without that, we're going to be done. And I like what I see here from the audience. Some tough questions. People are really holding your officials accountable. That is what we need. So I think we have that. we got to continue to do that. So let me go back a bit further about myself before I started in the administration. Um, I was born and raised in the Lansing area, but after high school, I actually left, and I went out to California, and I did my bachelor's in computer science at Stanford. Why would I do that? I was kind of a computer geek in high school, and I knew I wanted to major in computer science and do something with technology, and I wanted to be in Silicon Valley, and I knew that Stanford was a really good school, good program there, so I went out there. Did that program, and I also studied abroad in Japan while I was doing that program, which I'll touch on in a second here. After I graduated, I stayed in Silicon Valley, worked at a startup company that made cybersecurity software, which, interestingly enough, is not relevant again with these voting machines. Our company, we had several programmers who were actually former hackers, because they know how to hack it, therefore they know how to secure it. And so we were having a conversation at lunch one day, and we said, what do you think about these electronic voting machines? All those guys said, no way. You give us access to those for just a couple of minutes, we can do anything you want with them. And I'll never forget that conversation back in probably 2001, 2002. And look what we're seeing today. So it's very fascinating how these things just uh, come together. But I worked for uh, Palm after that. Do you remember like the Palm Pilot? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got quite a few people here. I worked on the smartphone version of that. Then after that, I heard a rumor that Apple was making a phone. I said, Apple doesn't make phones. That's not true. But I go to their website. Sure enough, they're hiring for phone engineers, which is what I was at the time. So I went ahead and threw my application and ended up getting a job offer at Apple to work on the very first version of the iPhone, right before it came out. And here's how God's timing worked out. Literally, the exact same day I got the offer from Apple, my boss at home was calling all of us in and asking us 
do you want to go to China to train them how to do your job? I said, no, but I got some news for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I told them I was going to Apple to work on the Apple. It's just amazing how our country's been sold out, isn't it? Amen. Uh, it's just, over the past decades, uh, a liberal economist said, we gave up the American middle class to build the Chinese middle class. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's accurate, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, wow. But thankfully, God gave me a way out when I went to work for Apple on the iPhone. This was when Steve Jobs was still there, a great manager, a great leader. We had a lot of secrecy, so we had to hide the phone, and we were supposed to use it to test it as our main phone. But we couldn't show anybody. So it's fascinating seeing how that all came together. But you talk about excellence and execution. Um, that guy, Steve Jobs, knows how to run a company with excellence. And I got to learn from that, and that really impacted me. While I was working at Apple, something happened at church, though. There was an opportunity to take a class about Christian missions. I was always curious about it. I said, how did the gospel start with only 12 people, then expand out to billions, which we have today? By the way, that's a pretty good success rate, isn't it? Starting from such a small group and getting to what we have today. And I think we're not done yet either, so I'm optimistic about that. But I was curious about how it got that way. So I signed up for this class on missions, and I was hooked literally from the first class. I said, I want to be a part of what God is doing everywhere. I want to be a part of that expansion. So I thought about it, I prayed about it, and I said, what can I do? Well, when I was in college, I studied abroad in Japan, and I studied Japanese. So I had the language under my belt. And then, the need in Japan is great as well, because you might not know, Japan is the least Christian country in the whole world. Less than 1%. If you are a Japanese church, and you get one baptism per year, you're in very good shape. That's how bad it is there. So I said, there's a great need over there. That's what I want to do. I want to go to Japan. So I went through the whole application process of my mission, which is called World Venture. It's pretty extensive, for good reason. Went through that process and decided to go to Japan with them. And so what they do is they say, OK, for a guy like you in Tokyo, Japan, it's going to take 90 grand a year. So you need to go around to all your Christian friends and the churches in your area, raise that money. And then once you raise it, you can go to Japan. So I said, OK, Jesus, it's you and me here. Let's go. And you know, it's money. And, uh, you know, I prayed about that and just really started planning out and God provided it in pretty quick time, two or three months. So I was very thankful for that and was able to go to Japan. So I ended up going to Japan as a missionary with World Venture. I did several ministries over there. Uh, one ministry we did I call Silicon Valley Nights. The average Japanese guy is not going to come into a church. But if you do a seminar on business, in particular Silicon Valley business culture, which is what I was involved in, they will come in to hear that because they like business. So we would do these little seminars at the church. The guys would come in, and the pastor would mix and mingle with them while I'm doing the seminar. And because I can speak Japanese, and I can read and write Japanese, I would do the whole presentation in Japanese, so don't have to worry about a language barrier or anything like that. So I would do that, and after we got done, we would mix and mingle with the guys. And it was a really good way of building a bridge between the church and the community. So I really enjoyed that. We also did homeless ministry. Another member of the church, myself, would go out and feed the homeless and give them a Bible and food and tell them about why they were doing it. You know, because God loves us, therefore we want to love others. Here, here. Now the Japanese would look up at me, the homeless person, and say, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> they didn't expect someone like me to be able to speak Japanese. So I'd tell them my whole testimony and how God led me to Japan. And they were always very intrigued. So that was really meaningful. So after being in Japan for several years, uh, I was there for seven years total, actually. And this is when Obama was president. I said, we got a problem here. If the bad guys are making things worse, fashionable and good guys are making things better, we got a problem. So I need to switch my mission field, as it were, from Japan to the government in order to make a difference there. So I ended up leaving Japan, and I went and did my master's at Harvard Kennedy School in public administration so I could learn about all things government and be ready for that step that God had for me. Now at that time, I had no idea I'd ever run for office or work in the government immediately. I just knew that God wanted me to do it and I followed whatever he wanted after that. But I knew it was the right next step. Harvard, as you can imagine, is super liberal. I mean, even more than you could ever imagine. It's pretty crazy. But I had fun there, though. It was really fun to mix it up with them. Especially when these super wealthy kids from privileged backgrounds come and try to talk to me about systematic racism and stuff. I'm like, oh, go ahead, you first, please. <laughs> and they really don't know what they're talking about, so it's all good. And my most memorable um, experience there was in one of my classes, we had a mock presidential debate. And I was one of the candidates. And the professor was the moderator. So he goes, Candidate Gibbs, what are you going to do about gun violence? And I said, here's my plan. 
I want every woman in America to have concealed carry. If you want to protect women from rape, assault, robbery, domestic violence, if you want to protect women's lives, you will need every woman in America to have concealed carry. Here, here. Reduce crime. And I said, frankly, if you disagree, that means that you're misogynistic and you have a problem with women. And now I'm triggered and I'm offended by that, so why don't you answer for that? It's fun to do that, so I really enjoyed it. So I uh, went ahead and graduated from that program, and this was in 2016. I did that master's a little bit later in life than most people do theirs, but I graduated from that program. President Trump won the election, and after I got done cheering for several days straight, um, and seeing that Dr. Carson was uh, appointed as the head of HUD, uh, a friend of mine who I met through this master's, who worked for Dr. Carson, called me one day, and I said, dude, give me a job. And uh, he helped me get into the administration, go through the whole process, background check, all that, and I started in our administration in uh, May of 2017. I began working for a rhino who was brought in as a political appointee, unfortunately, but he was not really with us. And he realized right away I was not all about big spending. He was a real estate developer, so he wanted to increase all the money. And real estate development is good, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's a good profession, but when someone is in it just for the money, that's the problem. And just to get the government to get, keep giving them more subsidies and stuff. And this guy uh, ended up clashing with almost everybody because he, he didn't go with our administration. And so he moved me all the way down the hallway and I had this huge office space just by myself. It was really quite something. And I also believe he was maybe behind CNN attacking me as well. But God used it for his purposes, which I did not know at the time. Ended up going up to the secretary's office after that to work for Dr. Carson on a few initiatives such as work requirements. You're getting free rent every month from the government, you've got to work. Now, if you're elderly or disabled, that's different. We're not talking about that. This is if you're able-bodied and you're capable of work, and you're getting free rent from the government, you got to work for it. Yeah. This is basic common sense. <laughs> Especially you think you're killing puppies and kittens from the response you get. Oh man, what are you doing? Why are you late before? Oh. <laughs> Just crazy stuff that they throw back at you. Even many of these rhinos. <laughs> so it was a really big problem. Uh, we did a couple of other initiatives as well, such as family formation. A kid raised with two married parents has way better outcomes in every area you can imagine. School grades, crime. Uh, delinquency, everything. The kids got much better outcomes when they're raised in a married two-parent family. But our government rewards the opposite. Yes. They actually pay for broken families instead of paying for intact families. Yes. And the more kids you have in a broken family, the more money you get. That is not a good thing. Now, does that mean that we hate anybody or we hate that, say, for example, a mother raising children by herself? No, we love her and we love those kids. That's precisely why we want kids to be raised in the safest environment for them which is with two married parents. But you think again, you're trying to kill puppies and kids if you try to propose this. They really hem and haul and everything at this kind of stuff. So it's a really, really big problem. But anyway, after that, I was appointed by President Trump as Assistant Secretary of Community Planning and Development. That's basically homelessness <coughs> money and grants to states and counties. This happened right when COVID kicked off. So my department, I had about 700 people under me and about an $8 billion budget. And we have, um, we have uh, COVID-19 right around this time. So Congress says, uh, do you want $9 billion in COVID relief? I said, no. If you want to have relief, you just end these stupid lockdowns to get people back to work. Yeah. 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 But they gave us money anyway. And the COVID bill was 5,400 pages. You guys, have you guys ever read a 5,400 page bill? I don't read the whole thing. I read the part pertaining to my department, which is only like maybe 50 of those pages, but 5,400. I guarantee you those congressmen haven't read it either. The committees are the ones who usually write those, and they're in cohorts with the lobbyists. It's a crazy system. So I'm sitting there implementing this bill. They gave me the money. The best I can do is make sure it doesn't go to Planned Parenthood and illegal immigration. They wanted to give uh, cell phones to homeless people for free. I'm like, uh, really? We want that person off the streets, for sure. We want to help them deal with their issues. But how is giving out free cell phones to accomplish that purpose? So it's just very weird stuff in there that we got rid of and brought it back on the right track. Then the congressmen were asking me, what was in the bill? I said, excuse me, you passed this bill. So you're asking me what's in the bill? 
They said, yeah. So literally, we're doing PowerPoints explaining to the congressman what was in the bill that they passed. It was just one of the most surreal experiences ever. But that is how DC works. Yeah. After that, um, President Trump nominated me to be the director of the Office of Personnel Management, which is basically the federal government's HR wing. Well, uh, my Senate committee uh, had eight Republicans and seven Democrats. You gotta pass the committee first before you get a full vote in the Senate. Well, guess who one of those Republicans was on my committee? Mitt Romney. Yeah. Oh. That guy's a piece of work. He was just basically decided he was not gonna let anyone through who was associated with the Trump. So we, it got blocked because of him, unfortunately, but it was what it was. It prepared me well for what I'm doing now. So, uh, you know, gotta use it anyway. And after that, near the end of our time, President Trump put me on the 1776 Commission, which was meant to combat this critical race theory yeah. garbage. Critical race theory is a total insult to the civil rights vision. Here, here. It says that you judge someone based on their color, not based on how they treat people, how they love others, their mentality, and their work ethic. No, 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 no. You're white, you're guilty, you're black, you're a victim, yeah. period. That's really sick stuff, and we gotta stand up and oppose it. Right, right. And then we had what I call our involuntary change of employment. Uh, in January of 2021, we had to submit our resignations and leave by noon on Wednesday, January 20th. Very sad, uh, unfortunately. And we all know the shenanigans with the election that led to that. Uh, so I have planned to maybe stay in the DC area, work for a think tank, work for some of the good people out there doing good work, uh, maybe uh, be out of the limelight for a while and not get attacked by the media and for a chain and kind of just be low-key and be a regular dude. Then uh, something happened. Uh, over on the west side of the state where I live, Congressman Peter Meyer became one of 10 Republicans who voted to impeach President Trump. Oh, yeah. It was his very first vote as a congressman. He had only been in office for days when he voted to do that. <coughs> Crazy stuff. So some of my friends from our former White House said, would you like to go back to Michigan where you're from and take your staff and run it against this Peter Meyer guy? I said, let me think about it, let me ask some people and get some wisdom and pray about it. And decided to go ahead and jump in the race. Yeah. I'd already been in the fray for four years in the administration, uh, working as hard as I could to stop this garbage that was happening, stop the crazy spending, uh, getting attacked by the media in the process, so I figured, might as well keep the fun going. <laughs> so I decided to go ahead and do that. I'm over it in the Grand Rapids area. We have a newly drawn district. Uh, it's gonna be huge this year, I believe, the way we're seeing. People just really uh, hate Peter Meyer because of what he did. Here, here. The staff in the back are president. Yes. The greatest reformed president in memory. Yes. Uh, we both staff him in the back of the here, here. I've seen the swamp, and I know our people in my district, in my state, and I've got the best of both worlds, I believe, to go ahead and get in there and try to set things right. Now, the problems facing our country are huge. You're not going to solve them overnight. I believe that we've uh, taken about 100 years to get where we are now. You look at about 1915, 1920, you had the creation of the Federal Reserve, the creation of the federal income tax, uh, the way in which we got involved in World War I, which was not uh, beneficial in many ways. Uh, we could have done it much better. Those events, I think, transformed so much in our country in a negative direction, and we're still paying the price today from the things that picked up back then. When they created the income tax, they said, oh, what are you talking about? It'll never be higher than 1%. Okay. What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, now we see where we are today. Amen. When the government starts something small, you better believe it's going to get big. Yeah. Never, ever believe them when they say it's just going to stay small. Amen. You can bet every single case it's all going to get out of control. That's why you got to stop them from the first possible moment. Amen. So here we are now, and I think I've spoken for long enough. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, I think it's going to be a very good year. Amen.